What's up, people? Back again, once a week, Bibophile Therapy. Welcome, new returning people. Thank you for liking and subscribing. And uh, yeah, if you're new here, thank you for clicking on. Uh, might not be for you, but at least thank you for clicking on. Uh, we'll start today with, well, of course, the election. I didn't vote to all you new people here. And uh, well, everybody's kind of upset that Trump won, but it's like, what fucking country do you guys think you live in? <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, and but to all those uh, people who call themselves leftists and shit out there, they're, they're not even left because they voted. You voted for a fucking genocide and you still lost. All you did was show your true colors that you don't give a shit about anybody who's dying. And you, you don't, you're not even fucking man enough, uh, to say the least. You're not even fucking man enough to withhold your vote. You still fucking voted for them. All these leftists, I can't even watch YouTube anymore. Because what do they, what do the people call it? And fuck the, fuck the Republicans too, fuck Donald Trump. But what do they call it? Uh, liberal tears. I'm, I can't deal with these fucking liberal tears anymore. But yeah, a little, you know, that's why I wrote down. If you play their game, what do you expect? What do you expect? Also, uh, there was a, after the election, big old, what, billion dollar stock jump. So Biden and Harrison got richer by losing. You don't think this is controlled opposition. Everyone's talking about, oh, how can the Democrats lose? How, how, why, why do they get, they want to lose. It's in their interest to lose. <laughs> what don't you, yeah. And okay, I also wrote this. I'm also kind of happy that Trump won. Maybe people will finally fucking get off their ass and do something instead of making fucking YouTube videos like I'm doing, right? And then, okay, to bring it back to the books. Uh, one of the reasons why I didn't vote I can't enjoy heaven while other people are suffering in hell. That goes back to uh, the, the culture novels, surface details, the battle for heaven and hell is a VR kind of thing. But they, have a, they uh, create an artificial heaven that you could go to, but they also make an artificial hell. And it's like, well, no, you're missing the point. And uh, yeah, believe it or not, we, people who live in America or uh, what do they call it? Western civilization. We're basically in heaven on this earth. This is basically as close as to heaven as we're going to get. And I can't enjoy this shit. I'm not going to vote for somebody while other people are fucking dying in misery. Genocide in fucking Gaza. Come on, guys. Yeah, there goes my little rant. I didn't vote. I hope you didn't. And like I said, I probably lost a bunch of uh, new people. But yeah, whatever. You, uh, you, you plant your flag and you see who comes. Just be yourself. We'll start with the books now. I read The Impiozium by Olga Torkoskos. I'm sorry, I'm never going to get that right. But it was a beautiful, beautiful written, beautiful book. A, horror, a, health, a health resort horror story. And this was about... A uh, young man who goes to, uh, he has TB, 1913, he has TB, tuberculosis, the consumption. So they send him off to a mountain resort, a uh, sanitarium. And of course the woods are haunted and there's noises in the attic. But it's also really about the horror, and it's really a slow burn. But it's also just about the horror of being yourself. About, yeah, just living in this life, how horrible it is. <laughs> And yeah, it was very, very good. I've watched reviews for it, and people were telling me that this isn't even her best. Even, I, I didn't know this, but she also wrote um, Plow Your Bones, or uh, yeah, uh, something like that. Uh, do Your Plowing Over the Graves or Over the Bones or something. And people were telling me that's not even her best. So, yeah, I'm excited. New author that I discovered. Uh, I'm happy to get into it. Oh, and also, it's really... Because this is about mainly about four or five uh, men having a long discussion. You know, they're in the they're in this resort together, and they're having discussions about politics and philosophy. And they even say in here, democracy doesn't work, people. Anyways, but they do a lot of women bashing. But if you read the the afterward, you know what the right what the author wrote. She tells you all of this uh, hatred towards women, all these quotes. You know, because they say, do women even have a soul? Women are a subspecies, you know, kind of stuff like that. This is all stuff that other writers used to write that uh, just like William S. Burroughs, William Shakespeare, John Paul Sartre. I'm looking for ones I recognize. William Butler Yeats, 
Jonathan Swift. Yeah. Oh, Jonathan Swift, Gulliver Travels. I'll get back to that. Uh, yeah, just a lot of uh, Fred Frederick Nietzsche. Yeah, and that goes back to it too. They also say in this book too, why are you listening to these dead people? What these people have no effect on your lives. Fuck man. I really enjoyed it. Five stars, thumbs up. All right. Uh, I also started. I'm, I'm DNF'd it. The boys enter the house. This is about the victims of John Wayne Gacy, the clown killer in Chicago. I didn't even know where he was from. He's from Chicago. But okay, the author is also from Chicago. He is a Chicago-based author who has been nominated for blah 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 for investigation on war crimes and everything, which doesn't even matter. So not that war crimes doesn't matter, but reporting about it doesn't matter. Anyways. He does such a bad job at writing this. I felt like I was reading a Wikipedia pages. I only got 75 pages in. But he also does the thing, because John Wayne Gacy had 33, 34 victims. So I thought, okay, yeah, every chapter should be about a victim, his life and story or something. No, he tries to do like a Game of Thrones. Kind of, he even says it in the introduction. He says, I jump around for entertainment shit's sake. You know, you shouldn't be trying to entertain people. I understand that, but... He jumps from 1961 to 1975 and uh, tells you he goes like, you know, like 33 victims and he's trying to cram four or five victims into one chapter. So he's jumping around. John did this. Uh, Jim did this. Tim did this. And he's and they, he's also telling you about their families. So I can't even keep track of it. I couldn't keep track of it. And that's what I wrote on my Goodreads. I wrote, I read a lot of epic fantasy and I could not keep track of all the characters in here because he, he was telling you about their moms and their dads, their, brother, their, their four siblings, which he would name by name. So many names. There were so many names you couldn't keep track of it. And then, yeah, even the family history. And then he kept on going into the history of Chicago. And this could have been so much better. I would have really liked. But uh, from what I got from it, you know, a lot of his victims were poor people uh, living in the hood living in the slums of Chicago and they didn't have the best, not even that their parents are, you know, you grow up in the hood, you, you are, uh, you're exposed to gang violence and drugs and all that prostitution, all that stuff, you know? And yeah, you know, uh, he could have been so much better. It could have been so much better. I read this for my book club. They're not going to mind that I didn't, that I didn't finish it. At least I hope, no, no, no one cares. I, I, when I go to my book clubs, a lot of the people haven't finished it. I think it's more just a socializing thing. Anyways. All right. I got into the golden age of science fiction. This was really good. Yeah, I've only got uh, four, four stories in, but just the introduction. The introduction, the forward. Let me see who it is by. It's by a really well-known guy. And my pages are stuck. Oh, and this is an older book, too, so it got that musky smell. All right. Uh, forward by Alex G. Perchance. I don't know who that is, but uh, Concerning Science Fiction for John W. Campbell. I think he wrote, I mean, he was Amazing Stories, one of the big old in the 50s. Uh, yeah, and then Introduction by Jeff Karkin. But uh, just regarding that, I wrote some notes about that. How in one of the things, in one of the introductions, he was saying, you know, you shouldn't even vote for somebody. You're voting for because this is a, has to do, the first uh, few stories have to do with the atomic bomb because this was written. It was originally published as the year's best science fiction uh, in 1946, right after the atomic bomb. And one of the introductions is like, yeah, you shouldn't vote for anybody who hasn't read the atomic, who doesn't know how an atomic bomb works. And it just made me think again of going to this election. None of these senators, none of these congressmen know shit. They don't read any of these laws. They don't know shit. They're fucking yes men. It doesn't matter. And uh, also in the introduction, it says that Lovecraft is not science fiction. They we went on a little rant about what is and what isn't science fiction. And uh, yeah, Lovecraft is, I don't know. I would, I would think Michael Moorcock and uh, Harlan Ellison would fight you on that one. But also what they mentioned was uh, Superman is, big, is science fiction, right? Yeah, he comes from outer space. I never thought about it like that. And also the bazooka was made because of a short story in science fiction. Somebody said, oh yeah, why don't we just make that? A bazooka, yeah. Also, this, uh, this is the year's best fantasy. In 1946, 
you know, they had tons of tons of magazines with science fiction stories. And the guy says that he went through over 6,000 uh, science fiction stories to get these ones. And these are the best ones. But also, he also goes on a rant, because I went on a rant yes, uh, last week, about how science fiction has to be, has to be some kind of be based in reality. And I said that, yeah, Red Rising didn't do it for my DNF did. That Red Rising, I didn't see how this was possible. But he also... In his introduction, uh, Jeff Conkin, Conkin, he says, yeah, but what you don't think is, because he was, he's on my side, like it has to be based on some kind of reality. But he also said, some of the, the first story in here, I didn't think could happen. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to add it in here, but he, uh, he got convinced to add it in here. So yeah, it, it depends on who you are, you know, your opinion always well, your opinion is your opinion, but do you think this could happen? And he, that's one of the questions he asked. Like, do you think this could happen? And that story was Solution Unsatisfactory. And it was the Manhattan Project before the Manhattan Project. People trying to make the ultimate weapon using bombs. I should have brought this out, but people don't realize it's before, like 1939 when worlds collide, the famous sci-fi novel, that has to do with nuclear bombs. Six years before the nuclear bombs even, I mean, the basic science was there. People knew that you could make a weapon out of this. So yeah, uh, this story, un Solution Unsatisfactory, was about the Manhattan Project and they pit a general in charge and uh, they're trying to stop the war. You know, yeah, it was very good. I, I really enjoyed it. The, great, the, the next story was The Great War Syndicate by Frank R. Stockton. Solution Unsatisfactory was made by Anson McDonald. Okay, but The Great War Syndicate was written, this is the story that he wanted to start with, was written in 1886, I think it was, about a war that's brewing between America and Great Britain. And America's scientists makes the ultimate weapon, which they, they didn't call it a nuclear bomb, but just by the description and the explosion, it's a nuclear bomb. It's basically a nuclear bomb. And that's how they make peace. You know, yeah, uh, hold a gun to the head of the rest of the world. And then the great, uh, another one, The Piper Sun by Lewis Paget. This was, this one reminded me about um, Philip K. Dick because it's about the aftermath. And Philip K. Dick, in his, a lot of his short stories, they have precogs, people who get affected by the nuclear blast, blast and now they're psychic. And this was about that, about a, a man who has to raise his family and they're all psychic precogs. He didn't use the word precog, but anyway, they're psychics, they are telepathic. And he's like, yeah, and uh, it's like that 50s pulp or 40s pulp where people are carrying around daggers and dueling each other again. It really reminded me of Philip K. Dick. And then the last one I read was Deadline. And that one was about, oh yeah, a secret agent is on an alien planet where he's trying to stop the they're both humans they're both groups of humans on this alien planet but uh one side is a uh, inventing the nuclear bomb and he has to stop it because they don't really know what's going to happen and that's what happened in real life too i never seen oppenheimer but i've seen enough documentaries about uh the nuclear blast that yeah the scientists really didn't know what was going to happen uh, when they and he thought yeah, you're gonna blow up the whole fucking world if you do this if you make this bomb And that's about a soldier going in infiltrating an enemy base trying to destroy the nuclear bomb Really cool. Very cool. Then I got into some more uh, Fritz Leiber Some more Pfeiffer and Grey Mauser. I'm loving it this time. They had to go back to the Thieves Guild and the Thieves Guild they found a map about one of their founding fathers and he has a skull with uh, jewels in it. And they have to get the jewels back to satisfy the ghost, the ghost in the basements. Uh, you know, bring back our brother who started this group. And Pfeiffer and Grey Mouse has to go in there, steal it back, steal it, you know, go on a big old adventure. But even, I want to get more into, you know, the, there's the, the pulpus uh, sci-fi. I want to find more pulpus, pulp uh, fantasy. There's a bunch of it. I know it's out there. I just got, I wish there was a big book of fantasy pulp. I'll find it. I'll find it. But yeah, Pfeiffer and Grey Mauser uh, robbing and stealing and fighting. Oh, I don't think they fought monsters, but okay. I read the second book in Elric. This one was called, uh, what was this one called? The Fortress of the Pearl, where El uh, Elric 
is on his uh, adventure. He's, uh, he got lost in the desert. Little boy finds him. And they can see, oh man, he's carrying this badass sword. He must be a wizard. So they hire him to steal uh, a pearl. A pearl in the fortress. And it's about that, you know. Um, him going on an adventure. He does fight monsters in this one. So, yeah. Uh, straight up more cock. I'm loving it. Yeah. And uh, it has to do with... Uh, it also has to do with uh, the multiverse. They're, I'm getting more into the multiverse, and they do they name drop. They see a city, and they're like, uh, one of his companions is like, "Oh yeah, it looks like London." So it's all that multiverse. Yeah, where you are at in in uh, Michael Moorcock. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I also read a detective story, the Big Book of Pulp. This one was by Frederick Nebo. And it's called Wise Guys. This one was about a, uh, a father. His son is getting mixed up in the gang life. And he goes to the detective. And the detective says, yeah, I'll help you out. But before he can even help out, the son gets uh, involved in a murder. And they have to hunt through the city for his son and the real murderer. Oh, I'm saying too much. But, yeah. And it was just the nice uh, pulpish uh, 1940s detective story, you know? Yeah, I'm really enjoying the old classic short stories. And uh, before I get into my comics, okay, I read Old Yellow. <laughs> Old Yellow. Oh my god. I knew the ending and it still got me. It still got me. <laughs> just, uh, yeah, about a boy and his dog. And if you don't know the story, I'm, wanting, I'm not going to spoil it for you. But yeah, uh... They're in the Texas wilderness, or, you know, the frontier for at this time. Uh, this book was written in 1950, but it takes place in, uh, like, the 1850s. So still, you know, the Texas just got, uh, uh, I think it was right after the Civil War. Anyways, yeah, a boy and his dog and farm life and fighting off bears and a bull, there's a bullfight that's in here that's uh, really comical. And yeah, uh... I was watching uh, Tori Talks, a fellow YouTuber, and she she said this is, and I like my children's stories, the old old school children's story, where yeah, they are not like children's stories of today. You know, just to say that they treated children more maturely, I guess. You know, little adults. Okay, we'll get into some of my comics since we were into the atomic age, with uh, the golden age of science fiction. I had this on my back. On my TBR for a while. When the wind blows, about uh, a young, uh, not a young, but an English couple living in the English countryside, and what happens when the bomb drops? And yeah, just it's it's uh, what happens when you believe all that government nonsense too, where uh, there goes the silo, the missile, the missile. But it, also at the beginning of this book. They're like, oh yeah, we have to, uh, we have to build our little shelter for the bombs. Oh yeah, you probably can't see it, but, but uh, they're like, oh yeah, we have to get some door frames, uh, pieces of wood, and makes like a little cubby hole. And it goes back to that 1950s propaganda where they were telling in America, duck and cover, nuclear blast, duck and cover. And uh, yeah, fair, a sad ending because yeah, of course this isn't going to save you. But there's also an animated movie I saw on it. That's what it looks like when the when the bomb goes off, just big old white. And and then yeah, and then they're even after the blast goes off because they do survive the blast, the initial blast. But they're like, oh yeah, uh, the post office should be up and running. You know, it's total faith in the government that oh yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> things are still going to go along as they always have. All right, then I got into. I read some more Aria. All right, uh, I started book seven of this, and uh, this was my favorite story. It's about it's summertime now. They go through the seasons. Every book is a different seasons, and I think that this is their second year on the planet training as gondolas, and uh, they're having a barbecue. And one of the girls, she's uh, she just got her hair done, and I don't know if you can see it, but yeah, then her hair starts on fire. If you can see the little flames there. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, no, that's probably the most horrible thing that could happen to a woman when she just got her hair done. And now, yeah. <laughs> but it's also it's that slice of life where 
you know, she's talking about why she got her hair done and she wanted to model herself after this other, uh, one of her uh, teachers. I want to be the best. I want to be like her. And the other teacher, one of the teachers is uh, kind of mean, but that mean in a good way where she's motivating, motivating you. And she's like, no, you got to be the best that you are. There's, there's only one of her. You have to be the, the first one of yourself, you know, that kind of thing. Where don't model yourself after other people. Be the best you could be. Good message. All right. And then I'll, here goes uh, a too much coffee man one. I'll try to do this every week. Here goes a too much coffee man. A short one. So, yeah, too much coffee, man. I'm enjoying those. And then, and then, and keep on. After I got done reading the Too Much Coffee Man, I wanted to read more of the 80s, 90s, um, punk kind of comic, underground comics. And I found this one, Dirty Plots, by a, a woman in Quebec, I think it was. So it's Canadian. And I can't show you a lot of these because it has a lot of nudity in it. And I don't know, uh, I don't want to, I'm only filming this once. But here goes her, uh, <laughs> you're reading... I think it's a, a statue of a, of a nun. <laughs> so yeah, just that punk stuff. Uh, let, uh, I could show you one or two. Yeah, see, yeah, it has to do with uh, women and her periods. And here goes a guy, okay. How he, uh, he takes baths once a week and then he, he reuses his water to do the dishes and washes his clothes. And then what does he do after that? Oh, he makes, uh, he makes beer but eventually it becomes really super famous. And then he has to odor, he has to make a, a public pool and a, and a laundry mat. <laughs> yeah, so, and a restaurant for the dirty dishes. And it's also a lot of her nightmares. Yeah, here goes a cat jerking off. I can't show you that, but yeah. Oh, here goes the KKK eating a dog, okay. But yeah, just, uh, if you can even tell by the cover, just that, that cool, 80s punk, 90s punk, that I'm, you know, I wanted to uh, read it. Yeah, and uh, I'm enjoying it. I'm trying not to go, I'm trying not to breeze by them, how you could just breeze by comic books and stuff. But yeah, okay, poem time. Okay, I'm getting back into my Walt Whitman, The Leaves of Grass. So I'm starting with the first poem of The Leaves of Grass. And forgive me on this one, because I already know I'm going to, you guys have those words that I know this word, I just can't pronounce it, you know? So bear with me. You're, you will know exactly which word I'm talking about. So the first poem, One's Self I Sing by Walt Whitman. One's, one's Self I Sing, a simple separate person, yet urca the word democratic, the word in mass. A physiography from top to toe I sing, not physiognomy alone, nor brain alone is worthy for the muse. I say from, I say the form completes is worthier far. The female equally with the male I sing. A life immersed in passion, pulse and power, cheerful for freest action, freest action. Formed under the laws divine, the modern man I sing. I butchered that. I butchered that. I'm so sorry. But I read it like fucking like seven, eight times. But it's uh, really Walt Whitman. I guess that like, yeah, the human body is amazing kind of thing. The female equal to the man. Uh, but I, I was reading the first line. One self I sing, a simple separate person, yet utter the word democratic and in mass. That we're all individuals, but we still say democratic and in mass and stuff. I really enjoyed it, I butchered it, but you should look it up, it's a short one. And yeah, hopefully I'll get more into my Walt Whitman. I will get more into the Walt Whitman. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you for watching. I'm sorry if you guys were disappointed by the election. You know, like I said, I could have saw it coming. Uh, you know, for, uh, for old yellow, for old yellow, if you wanna, if you made it this far and you wanna leave uh, emoji in the comments section just to show you're there. Leave a dog. Uh, oh, yeah, like, such a sad story, dude. But, and then it's like, you, you give this to children, right? <laughs> but, 
All right, that's it for me. Thank you for sticking around. Like and subscribe. Keep on keeping on.